Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome back to Virtual Vets 20. Today, we are live from the new Tevet headquarters building in Greenville, Tennessee. This is part 16 of our 18-part webinar series hosted by the National Veterans Small Business Coalition. My name is Earl Morgan, the NVFBC Program Director, and to our new attendees, thank you for joining us today. Again, we'd like to thank our eight sponsors who made this webinar series possible. Today's webinar is one hour. It's being recorded. If you have any questions for this webinar, please type it on the, on the text box on your screen. If you can't get to your question or don't know the answer, we will get the answers to you and display it on our webpage. So now let me introduce the Executive Director of the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, Mr. Scott Jensen. The floor is yours. Thanks, Earl. Uh, good, good morning and good afternoon to everyone who's out there. Uh, it's great to see you today. Today is a special day for us at MBSBC. As Earl mentioned, Uh, I'm sorry. We're uh, we're at, we have some technical uh, challenges here because, as Earl mentioned, we're off site today in a new location at the uh, new Tebbit headquarters in Greenville, Tennessee. This is a special day for me to be able to uh, to talk to you all um, and acknowledge two very special sponsors who who are bring this webinar series uh, to uh, play with us. And so I want to welcome Diane Dempsey from BAE who are uh, huge sponsors of MVSBC, huge supporters of this uh, particular webinar series and, uh, and great friends. And uh, to have all of us on site at one place, we said we need to bring everybody in, say hello, and let you see that there is a greater population of business people and business supporters and people who care about the work that we do. So Diane, thanks for being here. We appreciate it. And then, uh, and then next to me again, special, very special to us, uh, is, uh, is Tracy Solomon, uh, the CEO, founder, all things Tebbit in Greenville. And uh, it's special in many regards. Another huge supporter and sponsor of this webinar series and supporter and sponsor of MVSPC. Um, but equally important, um, just about an hour ago in a ceremony of welcoming and opening this new building, we awarded uh, Tracy with the Gordon Mansfield Award for 2020. So he's sitting here with a wonderful crystal uh, presentation here. I'll let you all see it. We're so proud of uh, Tracy and everything that Tevit has done for veterans and veteran businesses. Uh, if you haven't been to Greenville, Tennessee, get a hold of Tracy. He's a wonderful host. This is a beautiful area and a very inspiring story about what Tevit is doing um, in the defense industry, in the federal space, as a small business and the growth that they've seen. And you've got to come down and see this beautiful building. So it's great. It's great to have you too. Thank you for uh, for hosting us down here. And congratulations on your award, Tracy. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, I totally appreciate it. I was totally unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> My team knows I hate surprises. It was awesome. <laughs> we uh, we got him good. Everyone who knows Tracy, and uh, he was totally surprised. Yeah. So uh, you know, let's get on to business today. And we we have a friend here today. Um, that's speaking with us that um, is, is one of the most inspiring and um, most understanding professionals in the marketplace where we work. Um, Judy Brandt, the CEO of Summit Insight. Uh, I'm inspired by Judy every time I talk with her uh, personally and every time I hear her speak uh, in public and, and I just share her, her name and what she provides to so many people uh, because it's so valuable. For over 32 years, she's been an expert in federal contracting. As a consultant, speaker, and author, she's helped thousands of businesses, from solopreneurs to multi-million dollar corporations, find their fast track to success in the federal arena. Her latest book, Government Contracts Made Easier, the second edition, is a number one bestseller on Amazon. Her clients use her tools and technologies to get in front of the right federal buyers, and go on to drive millions of dollars in federal business. But as she discovered herself, there's a hard way and an easier way to do that. So let's find out more about how to make it easy and how to make that easy happen. I'd also like to point out before I uh, let Judy have the floor is Judy is also the vice president 
of Training and Education at our DC chapter of MVSBC. So uh, she is always in, always ready, and uh, always giving us what we need. Judy, thank you for taking time with us today. And uh, please welcome Judy. Thanks again, Judy. Thank you, Scott, and um, thank you, Earl. I'm just completely thrilled to be here. Um, my The light is going to change over the course of, the, of where I am, so there's not much I can do on that one. Um, so here we go. And uh, can you see my screen okay? Yes, no? Yes, we can see you okay. Uh, Okie dokie. Here we go. And yeah, I think it's got to be the screen as is, so hang on a second here. Here we go. Yeah, that's what we'll do. Okay, so welcome to Federal Contract Data Diving, how to bring home the gold. Um, I'm thrilled to bring you and cherry pick the best of 32 years in the federal market and lessons that took me a whole lot longer to learn and cost me a whole lot more than I think it should take you. So that's, that's really what I'm up to. Our mission today is to explore and discover the gold in the oceans of federal contract data. But of course, there's a secret mission. My secret mission is to give you an active experience for how you can do the same with federal buyers over and over again to engage with prospects and partners and for us to be able to engage in our journey together as well. Everybody good with that? We're gonna be using the chat really actively. So we're gonna be looking at where the data, where the data is, why the, the, we're looking to start with a journey into the heart of darkness of federal sales. Why federal contract data matters. Look at a basic federal data research workflow and some key data fields and a flyover as we go. And then I'll have time to answer your questions as well. If you're watching this in a recording, please drop me a note, judy.brat at growfedbiz.com. I'm here for you. So as you participate, please be fully present, be active on the chat, ask questions. I want to cover some data, but I want to be able to do some real searches and real stuff for you. Plan to take action. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to ask you, what commitment do you make to action? What are you going to do differently than you did an hour ago? So we're going to have a mini transformation here. Buckle up and get ready. And grab plan to grab resources via a link that I'm going to give you at the end. And so... And if you want to book a private follow-up call, you can do that. All right, so um, real quickly, um, so let's practice. Um, who's here in the room where it happens? I'm going to just open up a couple of polls so we can just um, uh, see. What's your top challenge in the federal arena for the year that we're in now? Take a quick look. Let's see what your top challenge is. Decide if you're going to pursue federal business, get in front of the right federal buyers, write better proposals so we can win more find something we can win or something else. So go ahead and poll must be open to be in with LinkedIn cheese hearing. So hang on a second here and distributing poll. So if you're on, please point and click. I'd like to see what your top challenge is. There we go, we got some responses. All right, so what's your top challenge right now? Is the, your answer here gives me an idea of what to really go a little deeper on. So let's take a moment. We've got 50% of the vote is in. How many of the vote can we get? All right, we're going to close this poll in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and all right. And so I'll share this. 50% um, of the folks who were here say getting in front of the right federal buyer sooner is your number one challenge all right and so i got that and so i'm going to do one more right now and so on a scale of one to ten how important is federal business to your plans to grow the company um one to three we're not sure we're deciding if we're in or out four to five somewhat important nice we'll answer the phone but we have other fish to fry uh six to seven is very important we need strong federal revenue to do well or an eight to ten essential federal works over 80 percent of our business um, how important is federal business to your plans to grow your company this year? Let's take a look, see who's voting, and how important this is to you. All right. 
And the reason I'm asking this question is because the content and the ideas that we're going to share today are going to make that kind of a difference for you. All right. And so 42% of the vote is in. A couple more voters, please. 53% of the vote is in. We're going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, two and a half, two and three quarters. And all right. So 75% of you uh, have say that federal business is at least an eight, eight out of 10 of importance. And so you're in the right place. And thank you for participating, which is going to be really important to what we're doing here. So Simon Sinek um, says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Now, you can argue with me as far as the day is long, but being able to connect with somebody on the level where they actually understand why you're in it, why you're in the federal space with them, why you're trying to make a difference for them can help. And in order to do that, you've got to know some things about them. And so you can't ask somebody to create an experience if they haven't had it for themselves. And so in the next hour, I'm going to give you an experience, a journey into relationship with me as a presenter. And I want you to notice some of those things that happen because that journey into connection is an experience that you need to create between you and your federal buyers prospects and teaming partners as well and you'll learn stuff as well so opportunity illusion is killing small govcons who have so much to offer and this is the core of my why um, anybody who's old enough to wear corrective eyewear probably remembers the commerce business daily published by the department of commerce came out daily in eight point type at best was the only source of opportunity 30 years later, your inbox is as flooded with opportunities and you think it's harder or easier to win business than it was 30 years ago. Just drop it in the chat, harder or easier, real quick. Drop a word in the chat, harder or easier? Let's see, harder or easier, just drop it in the chat. Harder or easier? The flood of what looks like opportunity creates what I call opportunity illusion. And that happens because people are asking the wrong question. Instead of asking, they're asking, what can I bid? And so long as that's happening, if you're not winning the business that you want, I want to encourage you, if you've ever been in an optometrist's office and you're having that experience where they go, better A or B, better A or B, right? And suddenly they flip lens and go, ah! Oh, I can see that lens flip happens in the federal market when you stop asking, what can I bid and start looking upstream at who is my buyer? If you don't get it, you don't get it. And for a long time, I didn't get that. And it cost me a million dollars in nearly 25 years to learn that. I wanna make sure that that doesn't happen to you. That's my why. That's why I care so much about this. So come with me for a moment into the heart of darkness of federal sales. Once upon a time, I had a dirty little secret. 25 years ago, I'd written a book, given lots of webinars, had thousands of clients, they'd won millions of dollars. I could tell you just about anything you wanted to know about federal contracting, anything at all except this one thing, how people actually won serious business. Now, it wasn't like I didn't want to tell you. I honestly really didn't know. And the people who did knew, no, they weren't telling either. I figured it really didn't matter till the day that it really, really did. Ever have one of those front end loaded con contracts where all the work's up front and then you're coasting for about another 10 months? In 2014, I won the biggest project of my career. It was going great. I was gonna be doing the research, the training and put together the sales plan and then just coach for another 10 months, working with seven companies in the federal market. They were new to the federal market. It was all going great. Till the day they said, okay, when are you making the introductions? And I said, the what? I said, the introductions. I said, no, 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 no. They said, yes, 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 yes. I said, no, 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 no. They said, uh-huh. And well, that was, this wasn't going well. My new mission involved making thousands of calls and hundreds of introductions for companies whose offerings range from city block size backup generator systems, waterless shampoo, snap lock glass food containers, and my favorite, root canal equipment. I was dialing for dollars for endodontics. 
and that point i only had really three problems first i have a graduate degree i don't do sales uh-huh well that time had passed second i was terrified that i was going to fail i had never done this before and this was my contract for the whole year my business was completely on the line for doing this well and third i was terrified that people would think i was a fail i forgot and i had to open the plan and pick up the phone and take a deep breath and I felt like the little kid who was just crawling along, falling down on his skates. It was awful. And the thing was, call after call after call came the day that I was talking to Dr. Ned Robertson with the Indian Health Service in Penobscot, Maine. And after a couple of calls, I actually met the man behind the mask. And he was telling me what he was doing on his day off. You know what he was doing on his day off? He was sewing curtains. And his nephew was just graduating from Georgetown Medical School. He was so proud of him. And all oh, those guys from BNL Biotech, sure. Set it up all. Oh, he'll talk to them too. And he hung up the phone. He went, oh. That was so hard. <laughs> and call after call, I realized that the people I were talk was talking to. They were just people. They had problems and they had vacations, they had kids and they had travel. And they had all the time in the world for me if I just slowed the flip down and got to know them. And that's only possible if I had chosen carefully the people that I wanted to be in front of so that I knew they were the people I was meant to serve. I was calling on people that it was worth taking my time to get to know because I knew that I had something that they really needed that could make a difference for them. So there was no heart of darkness in the end. There were only hearts of gold. And the personal relationships would open the doors to the winds. I finished my program, I made my calls, but the seven companies I made calls for never sold a dime because they didn't take the handoff and build the relationships. But the gold was in all of the calls and the opportunity, all the opportunities were there in the conversations. And that can happen for you. It took me a ton of time and money to learn this. 25 years and over a million dollars, a lost opportunity I'd be sitting on if I hadn't avoided learning about sales and how the research connected with the humans. So my hard one mission is to turn those lessons into something you can take away. So what's a lead? Real quick. A lead is somebody whose role and activity and visibility points the way to potential opportunity. Many leads build a story. Now we're going somewhere. In the same way as whatever your favorite detective story might be, or maybe you're uh, an old fashioned uh, Arthur Conan Doyle or Hercule Poirot fan, uh, Sherlock Holmes, detectives are building a story through human intelligence, through tracking down leads. And in order to do that in federal contracting, we're incredibly lucky because those leads are right in front of us. So rather than going, oh no, not more calls, who can tell me? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, what was the advice that Mark felt, deep throat, gave to Bob Woodward in the parking garage in Roslyn, Virginia. Drop it in the chat. What was that advice? Half the people on here are old enough to have had that happen to you in real life. What was the advice? Because it's relevant here. Drop it in the chat. What was it? What was that advice? Anybody? Drop it in the chat. Use the chat, use the Q&A. The advice is follow the money. Let's follow the money. Contract data generates contact data. And most folks look at this cycle as beginning with congressional approval and forecast. And the agency puts out their purchasing plans. The request um, becomes more formal, the, the competition field narrows, set aside potential is evaluated, you have pre-solicitation, then formal competition begins, you get solicitation, then finally there's award data, right? 
Yes, but federal competitive intelligence cycle starts when you follow the money. In other words, to move forward, start by looking back. Contract award data for who buys what you do can help you focus on who you really want to focus, who really, really want to do business with and understand how they behave. What's their easy button? And I'm going to unpack that now because if you haven't already dedicated yourself to becoming a master of federal contract data, there's a reason why you want to do it. And that's because the tools starting October 17th just got a whole lot better and more powerful. We're going to take a look at that. So we talked about diving. Savvy divers have a dive plan before you go diving into the water. And the same is true with contract data diving. You want to have a plan to do it. So I welcome you aboard onto our little diving expedition into data diving. So a few things to look for. First, who buys what you do? How much did they spend? Who did they buy from? How did they describe the purchase? When is the contract complete? Where will the work be done? All of those let you choose where are, is there so much opportunity, so many people to talk to, you're never going to run out of good opportunities to pursue for the next two years. And you can concentrate. But you track that down by looking at the past contract data. The public data gives you over 300 pieces of information on every contract co transaction based on a contract that's worth more than $25,000 and sometimes a lot less. That data shows you created and modified the contract record. If that person is not the one who signed the contract, they're probably sitting in the same office with the people who did. They're one of the five players and layers where you've got to know people in order to build the network of relationships you need to be successful. If you've ever lost a contract by a small margin, or worse yet, the other guys won and at a higher price. That's a flag that there's a relationship in there that isn't with you. And so in order to make that relationship with you, you got to find out who is buying what I do and get to know them before the next requirement is written. And that starts with data. Think about it as taking a huge net into the ocean. You're bringing back all kinds of things. You're releasing the turtles and untangling the dolphins. And then you sort out the fish you've got left and figure out what's of value to you. And that's a little bit like what you're going to be doing when you're data diving. But you can answer questions like, what is my buyer's easy button? How much work is awarded using a GSA schedule? Or how much is, used, uh, is awarded using another GWAC? How much? How accessible am I as a vendor to people who have a particular way that the data already shows they like to buy? Where am I going to invest my time in making it easy for specific buyers to do business with me? I've talked to a lot of companies who have invested tons in being on lots of contract vehicles, but then those vehicles aren't driving money to the bank. They're just sitting there because you need to be building the relationships with who? Data is going to show you. So data is going to show you things like how much work is awarded using simplified acquisition. How many offers do the buyers usually get? So federal procurement data system has now migrated over to beta.sam.gov. It's complete, it's official, and it's free. And the reason why you'll want to use that instead of usaspending.gov is because there is actual data on who the federal humans are who awarded the work. I'm now going to work without a net. This system migrated on the weekend, and I'm going to see whether or not it is going to be talking to us right now. So I'm looking at all award data, and I'm going to change my screen share. Earl, could you please tell me whether you can still see my screen over on beta.sam? Somebody tell me if you can still, st still yes, see my screen. Okay, excellent. All right, so we're going to see what it is that there is to see. Um, I'm going to go over to uh, just do a broad search and look at a single data record. All right, so I'm going to do something easy that's likely to show up. I'm going to search for cyber. There's only 5,200 and change results. Now, when I'm in here, there's stuff that goes that, that can, is older, and I want to search by date modified. 
and the word cyber is in here. So I'm going to find something that I think is kind of interesting and is fairly, is fairly recent. So, all right. So we've got C4ISR. There's stuff published today. So let's take a look at this guy. Now this is an event. Hang on a second here. Let's see what we've got. Justification and award, managed services. So I have not looked at any of this stuff before. So we're just going as we go. So we're looking at soliciting for cybersecurity services. All right, let's take a look at this guy. Uh, this solicitation. So here, what I was looking for and is not showing, I'm looking for contract, past contract data. And I'm not looking for solicitations. I'm not looking for opportunities. So right now, it is not showing up the way I want it to. I'm not surprised. So I'm going to see whether or not a FPDS has been totally decommissioned. Because if it hasn't, then we're going to look there instead. All right, so the po my point here is to show you a fields and a data record. So these, this is going to be accessible under beta.sam.gov. And so here, this same data is going to be available. And I'm going to sort here by date, the recent one. Miracle Systems, how about that? I'm so glad we're able to do this. So here, if the action obligation is zero, that's an administrative or setup, contract setup. All right, so let's look at here. We've got a delivery order. This is interesting. All right, so let's go over here. And we're going to view this. So this is transaction number 500, according to this. If I view the whole thing. So with this particular contract, we got P.E. Smith. So we've got a little bit of a clue, a couple of initials, and a last name. It's a start. So this is a transfer. Actions as a contract modification. All right. So this particular thing is being done against a GSA schedule. Starts with GS. Okay. The contract itself um, is estimated to run until August of 2024. This is a contract that was supposed to have started in February of this year, and the Current contract uh, action is worth $886,000, but the whole contract contract as a whole is built to carry over $8.3 million worth of work. So VMD Systems Integrators was the one it was awarded to. It says where they are. Gives you some idea for ITS cybersecurity as the program. Place of performance is DC. You can see the product service and NAICS codes, but take a look down here at the description of requirements. Cybersecurity support contract new award. There's 250 characters here where the buyer can write a story, a super tweet at any rate, worth of characters of what it is that they're doing. And so sometimes the NAICS code and the product service code that the buying organization uses to code the contract doesn't necessarily reveal as much of the story as what it is that is written here in description of requirements. So this is one takeaway. When you're trying to figure out who, how is my buyer describing what I do, to be able to search on your keywords in the description of requirements field is really going to be helpful when you're pulling all of your data. So this is this tells you it was 8A competed. It was on a GWAC. So on this GWAC, there were 665 offers. There were three offers for this particular opportunity. And so you think about how much data is just being displayed here on this one transaction. So imagine if you had the data that could tell you about all of the buying happening in your part of the federal arena. Think about how powerful that would be. So now life gets interesting, right? So I'm going to pop back over to here. So we've taken a look at a data record. I want to encourage you to invest time to learn how to pull data through the beta.sam.gov ad hoc reports, all right? Because the truth is you're going to spend time and you're going to spend money. All you get to choose is the mix. You're going to spend time and you're going to spend money. All you get to choose is the mix. So when you can buy a big data subscription a lot of the time, the big expensive data subscription company services weren't built for your specific company. So you can get an inbox full of inbox full of things that look like opportunities, but somebody else has got there first. Or you can roll back from what can I bid, shift the question you're asking to who's my buyer, 
How can I get to know them? What do I know about who they award work to? What, I know, what do I know about the contract vehicles that person uses to award work? And start to get to know them before the next requirement is written. So if, you have, if you're looking for more success in the federal market than you've had in previous years, I want to encourage you to consider making that shift to the move, up, move upstream. When you're looking at all the award data, in order to go and find how to create an ad hoc report, you want to go over to the resource section and explore the library and take a look at contract data and find out the information on ad hoc reports. You want to be able to find their videos on how to create an ad hoc report. Because when you do that, when you can pull down, and I'm going to just drop the link to this in the chat for you. All right, hang on for just a second, and away we go. I'm going to drop the link to the chat in the chat because when you can learn how to pull data down, all right, you want to be able to export your data to a spreadsheet, and that's when things get interesting. All right, one second here, trade over, and once you do that. You can select the fields and lay them out in an order that tells a story. And so here's an example of one that, and I'll, I'm going to flip over to um, a real data file that I've used, if you'd like. So you can also ask me some questions about it. But here I start with contract name, then contract agency name, then a couple of other fields, place of performance, then the approved by, modified by, prepared by. There sometimes you'll get a first name and a last name. Sometimes you'll get a full email address of a federal human who's touched that data record and can be your start of unpacking who are your players at all your layers, okay? So once you can sort that out, you can filter to see what's the profile of buying activity and leads in just the agencies that say spend a lot of money on what you do. The number of questions you can start to answer gets really powerful. And you can make good decisions about where you want to focus your efforts and then start to build a plan around just the people who buy what you do and buy a lot of it and really get to know them. The key data fields that you really want to pay attention to, you want to make sure that these are in the report that you pull out, is the contracting department and agency, place of performance, city and state, the approved by, modified by, prepared by, these are the start of the clues to your federal humans. Estimated ultimate completion date. So you can work backwards from that and say, all right, not instead of looking at what is there appearing that I can bid on today, that uh, there's less than 30 days to go and it looks like it's set aside for a company like mine. It's been, if it's been set aside for a company like yours, the buyer already probably knows a lot more than two companies that could already do that work at a fair and reasonable price. You can throw your hat in the ring, but if there's less than 30 days to go and the requirement is complex and meaty, what if instead of writing the proposal, you took a step back and said, how can I get to know this person and the other kinds of requirements they might have that are similar that they'll be buying more of? So looking at estimated completion date of the current contract, then working backwards, say for right now, you might be looking at what kinds of contracts have estimated completion dates of fall of 2021 for what I do. Get to know those buyers and players and layers a lot sooner. Get to know them before stuff comes out in the forecast or see how the information about the people who have made past contract awards relate to the people who are in the forecast and start to put together your cast of characters. You can see what type of set aside they used or if they used any set aside at all. You can look at the NAICS and product service codes that are on that record, see whether or not those codes are on your beta.sam record so that when somebody goes searching for someone who can do that work by NAICS code, they're more likely to find you. Search on description of requirement and use keywords. But looking backward, consider searching on records for your competitors as well. If you search on records for your competitors, you can see who's awarding work to them. You can also see what are the keywords that buyers are using to describe what they do. 
that lets you start to do a full data build out of what's all the purchasing activity happening in the federal market for what I do. Vendor data fields will show you city to date zip where this vendor is uh, and show you how much spending is happening now, how much has happened against that contract vehicle and how much money there is left on the vehicle. So one of the things I promised that I would do is to give you a search process checklist. So this is the process that professional analysts use to transform federal contract data into intelligence when you're doing a build out for a specific company. You develop some keywords. What are the words that buyers are using to describe what you do? And you can pull that out of description of requirements fields of your competitors' awards and of your own past ones. You may have to build up a set of keywords. So multiple exports of the data build out your whole data set. Once you've got your Excel file, you can clean it up and select and arrange the fields in a storybook kind of order. And that's something I can share with you. You can then filter and code those data subsets and be able to sort for patterns and pick out the priorities. Who's doing a lot of purchase of what you do? And pivot tables can really start to show the story. So the niche identification, you do that through a combination of keywords and competitor records. You're going to export your data to Excel, set up your spreadsheet, and then start to filter and look for patterns and analyze your spend by agency, by individual buyer, by contract vehicle, by who are the primes who are taking home the work, by region as well. Close to home may be good opportunities for you. And look at the NAICS and product service code so that you've got codes in your record that your buyers are using most often. All right. So there are four secrets to unlocking federal contract treasure. All right. And here they are. First, to start with keywords. If you just search on NAICS codes, you can miss stuff. The description of requirements field is where the gold is. And that lets you build out the full picture of what's happening in your market niche. So you can then make a confident, narrow choice where there's lots of opportunity for you. The second key to digging out the gold is to look at the top two to three competitors contract records. Pick the top two to three people who are busy nibbling at your lunch in your part of the federal niche and look at the NAICS codes, the keywords, the customers, the vehicles that represent 80 to 90 percent of the activity in your niche and with the buyers where you want to do business. And understand your buyer's story. So you'll start with the points of contact created by, modified by, approved by. Take a look at the contract vehicles. One of the biggest struggles people have is do I need a GSA schedule? Anybody who's trying to twist your arm about needing a GSA schedule and they haven't done this analysis, they haven't asked you, what does your analysis show? They're not your friend. Way too often, a buyer will say, oh, you gotta be on GSA. And companies go and they spend thousands of dollars and months or years getting a GSA schedule when the data shows that that buyer didn't use a GSA schedule at all. It was a handy way to tell them to, for them to tell you to go away. So. If you've got the data, the data will show you who's using a GSA schedule, who's using some other kind of vehicle, and how much, and it is considerable, business in your niche is awarded using no contract vehicle at all. And so this is what I mean by understanding where your buyer's easy button is. The data shows you how they like to behave. And so you can show up ready to do business in a way that they're comfortable with. Uh, Number of offers, you can get a sense of how broadly they're competing something. Simplified acquisition is really helpful to know because a buyer can, if they're comfortable with you, make three phone calls and award up to a quarter million dollars worth of work. Convenient. It's helpful to know whether or not they do that at all in your niche and the data will show that to you. So you have some ideas because that means you can approach your buyer with some Simple ideas to do a small contract, solve a small problem for them, and build from there. You need to know your players at all five layers. And I'm going to just tell you what those are. Small business specialist, 
is it almost always, 99% of the time, they're not your buyer. If you look at the titles of the business cards of the people that you know in the federal arena, you've got lots of small business specialists and you're frustrated because things don't seem to happen, it's because you need to know players at more layers than the small business specialist. Contracting. Contracting officer has a power that the President of the United States does not have. That's the legal authority to award a contract to your company. Contracting layer also includes the contract specialist who does a lot of the prep, a lot of the filtering, and uh, can have a lot of information for you about how business is done. So you've got to know people at the contracting layer as well. I have all kinds of conversations with people about, well, the buyer is the contracting officer, or the buyer is the end user. You need to know people at all of those layers because they talk to each other. Sometimes the end users have a great relationship with contracting and they just are able to, and they know how to easily write a specification, give it to contracting, contracting knows what to do with it. At other times they're at loggerheads. They don't talk, there's not a lot of trust, but you have to know the people involved at every single office where you want to do business. The third layer is end user. By that layer, I mean that can include the person at the pointy end who's out in the field who's stuck with the decision to buy whatever weapon they've been given. It can include the person at the help desk. It can include the project manager, the program manager. It can include the district office manager. Uh, sometimes the end user, you've got people who are on contract on site as well. And so they have a lot to say about how the requirement gets written and they know a whole lot about what they like and they don't like about the experience they're having right now. They're a critical player for you to get to know. And so the people in contracting, sure know the people in end user, you've got a tight relationship there and you've got to know people in both places. You also need to know who the stakeholder is. That can be in IT, the CIO, uh, it could be the base commander. They're the person who gets tied to the stake and tarred and feathered if things don't go well. They are. They can be a speaker at a conference. They're not the one who's choosing you. They do care about how much, how fast, get it done. They're the one who gets on the front page of the paper and get and or gets has to resign if things go really badly. The buck stops there. But the stakeholder is not, very rarely are they involved in actually the contract decision. You need to know who they are. And you have industry. That can be the incumbent prime, it can be your competitors, but I want you to think of them as competitive mates. You've got to be able to see who the players are there. And some of them may be already on contract, but dual had it, or they've got an industry, industry card or a, a .gov or .mil ID. All of them can affect your access to an opportunity, all of them have intelligence to give you as you work your way through developing relationships. All of them have different problems. All of them have different needs, different hotspots, different things that can get their interest and start a conversation. We've never been in a more powerful time to start a conversation with somebody that can be as simple how are you? How is your family? Is everybody safe? We have that power as human beings to simply have that connection and take the time to get to know somebody and listen to what's going on with them before we charge ahead into products and services and solutions. Because the time you take to get to know them, to research them, not just to look at their contract data records, look them up on LinkedIn. There's 2.1 million federal employees are on LinkedIn. Where did they work before they were in the job they were in? Have they been in that job for 23 years versus what might be important to them if they've been in that job for just a year and a half? How risk averse are they gonna be? How likely are they to award a big contract to a new vendor they've never heard of? Hmm, tricky. What can you do to make that easier for them? How can you get to know them a little better? It starts out with knowing who they are in the first place. So when you've got data, you can break out pivot tables really quickly to see, for example, in this, um, in this search that I did, I wanted to see when the word staffing was in description with this data set, only 150 orders out of over 2,300 were on GSA schedule. But that could tell me the Army did a lot of staffing, Indian Health Service did a bunch, and uh, National Institutes of Health did a lot. 
but GSA schedules were not going to be that helpful for this particular staffing company. Pivot tables can break out in a really orderly way, say in this example, in DISA, they were using a GSA schedule to make that award, and Christian Fox, now you've got some other stray characters in that email name, but you're real close to having a usable email name there, and DKW Communications was the vendor. So you can see actual full or partial email addresses for the people that they're awarding, who are awarding the work and who they're awarding it to. Those are leads. Those are the starts of relationships. And the contract number, that shows you their easy button. So these first two, three of them were going through GSA schedules. And the third one looks like it was going through Homeland Security, FEMA headquarters, because you can see the sequence of characters in the contract. Pivot tables, we talked about, can break out what vehicles are they, are they using. And you can also see how much work is awarded without a contract vehicle at all. So the path to success, the reason why data is so powerful is because when you research the spend, you can choose your target agency with confidence instead of being mile wide and an inch deep and nobody cares you're alive. And too many companies are having that experience. You have expertise, services, products that can make a profound difference in how our nation is served, how individual federal humans are able to serve the government of the United States and serve citizens. And it's possible for you to make that difference in their lives and their mission when you get to know them. So after you choose your target agency, you can pinpoint and go deep, see who you know, but see who you need to know. So you have relationships with the players at all five of those layers. You could start conversations, get to know the buyers before the competition starts, including pre-pre-solicitation, as well as requests for information, sources sought, all of that. Focus, start conversations way before RFP. If there's one thing that you might do differently, I encourage you to shift and work way more upstream than you might be long before competition for formal RFP starts. And build your plan around the people who buy what you do. So I'm going to pause because we got some opportunities to do a couple of live searches. I want to ask what questions you've got because I have something for you. Our mission today was to really get a sense of the gold in the ocean of federal contract data and to give you a fully engaged experience of really, uh, really getting the sense of how relationships can shift and how if I've done a good job today, then I've managed to solve a little bit of a problem for you and offer you something that can help. So I wonder what, based on what we've covered, what one thing do you commit to trying today? What will you do differently? What will you think about? Drop it in the chat if you would, please. I'm not seeing anything in the chat at the moment, but I may not be looking in the right place. So please take a look. And what will you do differently? This is what I said I was going to ask you. Go meet. Yep. What else? I'm having difficulty seeing this, so something harder. Hang on a second. I'm going to pull this out. So much harder. Uh, follow the money, go meet. What else? What are you going to do differently? Drop it in the chat or drop it in questions. What are you going to do differently? I'm going to finish with resources that can help. Your bonus here is three easy lessons in free federal market research. I've got a step-by-step -step illustrated guide and ebook for you. All right. And this is making this process of looking into data in places that at a broad level, I'm going to do um, the, this, these lessons include ways to, uh, find out whether or not GSA schedules are helpful, how to use some of the other federal data tools, and make your choice for where you want to focus. And so I'm going to go and grab the, the link and put it in the chat. And I can spend a little time going through 
and filtering. So I'm going to put that link here. Three easy lessons in free federal market research. You can go get it. And I can also go back to the combined search terms demo and show you a little bit of that. So um, anybody want to see some of the filtering that you can do with this? Just yes, no? Yes, no in the chat or yes, no in questions. Ah, we've got some what are you doings? Yeah, who's, uh, yeah. All right, Angela's gonna build relationships with buyers. Carol's gonna research contracting officers. Oh, sorry, the chat's not working. Thank you for using this. Yes, exactly right, exactly right. So um, we can spend a little bit of time, not sure why the chat is a little bit challenging here, um, but you, the link to the ebook is there. If I've done a good job, then we've built enough of a relationship that you want the handout. And I say that because we are getting to know each other. Some of us, uh, some of us know each other from before and some of us don't. And that's, gonna, that's the experience you're gonna have with your federal buyers as well. Lots of them, you know who they are, they don't know who you are. So you came to this webinar because you were curious, you had an interest, maybe a problem, maybe a challenge. 50% of the people who are on this webinar said you're here because you wanna get in front of the right people sooner. I've given you a way to do that. Once you have data, you can make a narrow choice on who for you the right people are. That also means that you have the chance to get to know them and know a lot about them. So you have smart questions to ask and you can think about if I were in their shoes, what might interest them? What might make a difference for them? I gave thought to that when I showed up to do this presentation for you. What might make a difference for you if I could offer you three easy lessons in free federal market research? Would that help? I hope that it does. And so this is for you. And that also means that we can stay in touch in the months that come as you move into your, your next wins. So I would love to work with you and your team. I'd love to hear more about what's happening for you in the federal market and it certainly answer questions that you may have right now. So um, whether it's Scott or Earl, if there are questions you can relay, questions other folks have, I would love to answer more of your questions for folks right here and love to know what's your aha, what, what are you taking away from this that was valuable and I hope some of it was. And I'm happy to go and do some more live data diving into beta.sam.gov contract data. So where can we go, Earl? Judy, uh, thank you so much. Um, if there are questions, you should be able to see them on your uh, uh, question and answer section on your okay. side. But uh, I, so we can give it a couple minutes in case we do sure. have some time for some additional mm -hmm. last minute questions here if anyone would like to interact. But we also appreciate you always sharing your contact information and being so willing to, uh, to talk with our participants one-on-one. -on -one and, and we often know the value of that. Uh, as opposed to a, a group question. So okay. if, we're, if we're not seeing any questions, I will uh, say thank you. It's always a pleasure. It's great to see you. Uh, look forward to the times when COVID lifts and we can do these types of things uh, in person and get to see one another and, and interact as well. So uh, again, uh, Earl and I thank you all for joining us. Uh, uh, from the uh, the sunny hills of Tennessee <laughs> today, and uh, it was uh, it was great to see you all. Thanks for all those who attended, um, and in particular, again, great thanks to Judy Brandt for for uh, being with us today and sharing such great insights. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you all so much. Go forth and win your 2021. <laughs> thanks, Judy. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, bye.